this is section three of the five equal rights um, notes. All right, in this section we're going to look at um, other groups that we haven't talked about so far uh, in this in this unit where we're talking about civil rights and um, so. We left off yesterday with women's rights. Um, today we're going to look at uh, rights for Mexican Americans, um, Native Americans, Asian Americans, uh, Native Americans, so uh, just some different minority groups and their struggle for uh, an increase in, in um, civil rights in the 1960s. So, Spanish speaking population, people who use, or people whose family origins are in. Spanish-speaking Latin America, called Latinos, were Hispanics and come from many different places, sharing the same language and often similar cultural elements as well. Hispanics and Latinos lived in many parts of the western United States before American settlers arrived. Um, if you don't remember, uh, kind of think back to your, uh, you know, to your early American history classes, um, you know, maybe even some of your uh, Oklahoma history classes. And you have uh, talked about some of that stuff. Well, we sort of covered it during the Spanish American War, but uh, but really not. This would have been more covered when you were in um, in junior high. Uh, but anyway, Mexican American Mexican Americans have always made up a large portion of or the largest portion of this group of U.S. Latinos. Beginning in 1942, Mexican immigrants came to the United States under the Bracero program. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, talked about it in the fall and, and not too long ago. Again, this granted Mexican immigrants temporary guest worker status. Um, and in a period of 25 years, over 4 million entered the United States. They were targets for deportation, though, starting in the 1950s. This is partly due to um, kind of the second Red Scare uh, and just a, a heightened sense of... Um, a mistrust for just any immigrant in the United States, uh, sad to say. Um, but, you know, we watched the HUAC hearings and different things um, uh, in, the, in the 50s. Um, so just kind of put your mind there for a second. We're going through some of this. In 1965, the United States passed the Immigration and Nationality Act amendments, which eliminated national origin quotas, or national origin quotas, excuse me, uh, we talked about this when we were going through the 1920s, if you don't remember, and then kind of brought it up again during the Great Depression and again during World War II. So we've had quota systems for a long time, up until this point in 65. This caused the number of legal Mexican and Asian immigrants to surge uh, or go up in the coming decades. More than 400,000 Mexicans arrived in the 1960s, another 630,000 in the 70s and more than 1.5 million in the 80s. Uh, there's various reasons for this. Um, uh, it's something we can talk about more, and I've, I've got some different videos to show you as well that maybe will um, kind of shed some light on the reasons for the, the jumps in, in increase. Um, after World War II, large numbers of Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Cubans migrated to the U.S. and settled in mostly urban areas like New York's New York City, Miami, etc., or Miami, etc. As citizens of U.S. territory, Puerto Ricans became or came legally in search for job opportunities, and then Cuban and Dominican immigrants uh, came as political refugees. So, um, we're going to talk about the, the Cuban Missile Crisis coming up here in just a few weeks. We get to some notes regarding uh, President Kennedy's presidency, and that'll be one of the, the first topics we'll go over. In the 60s and 70s, influenced by growing uh, civil rights movements in the South, uh, Latinos increasingly fought for civil rights. So, as we saw with uh, with women in the 60s, they were sort of inspired by uh, the civil rights movement that the African American community had put together. And the success, um, thankfully, that it was having. Uh, the same could be said for other minority groups around the country. And, and uh, the country was ready to, to listen to this, and, and the, the presidents that we had in that era, at least at the beginning of it, were ready to, to hear some of this out, and some laws were being passed. And so, um, you know, everyone who felt marginalized, uh, you 
you know, those groups kind of saw what was happening and, and, and tried to, you know, to get more civil rights and awareness for their own uh, groups at that time. Because they migrated, or excuse me, sorry, the most influential Latino activist was Cesar Chavez, there's a picture of him there on the right. Um, he fought for the rights of farm laborers who are among the most exploited in the nation because they migrated from farm to farm and sometimes even different states following the seasons. Uh, they were often known as migrant farm workers. In 1962, he organized a farm workers union in California, uh, merged this union in the late 60s to form what became known as the United Farm Workers. Uh, they were committed to nonviolent tactics and implemented a workers' strike and consumer boycott of table grapes. This led California lawmakers to pass a 1975 law requiring collective bargaining, so the right to negotiate, that's what that means, between growers and union representatives, giving farm workers a legal basis to ask for better working conditions. Well, Chavez was focused on uh, the rights of farm workers, a broader Mexican American social and political effort grew, which became known as the Chicano Movement. Part of this was dedicated to educating Latinos about their heritage and history, and another part was focused on quality of life issues. Um, uh, most of the Chicano Movement's energy was focused on attaining political strength for Latinos. Uh, uh, Jose Gutierrez organized the political party. Uh, La Raza Unida in Texas. The party worked for better housing and jobs and supported Latino political candidates. In the 80s, six Hispanics sat in Congress representing districts of New York to California. As with the Civil Rights Movement, the younger generation took the lead in demanding change for Native Americans. So, we're talking about the Civil Rights Movement um, in our last chapter of notes. Uh, it was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, and then the same could be said uh, could be said here with with Native American young people. So the National Indian Youth Council formed with the goal of preserving Native fishing rights in the Northwest. Later, the group expanded its goals to include more broad or broader civil rights for Native Americans. In 1968, activists Dennis Banks and George Mitchell founded the American Indian Movement. There's a little. Uh, button of it down there in the bottom right corner for their, their logo. And then if you look at the middle of that logo, it says, Remember a Wounded Knee. Uh, I've got a video that will show you in class that will kind of um, expand on that a little bit. As Native Americans' dissatisfaction with the government grew, their actions became increasingly more militant, more active, less committed to nonviolent. That's what that means. It doesn't mean they're seeking out violence. It just means... Um, they're not as committed to it as, as time goes on because frustration builds. In the late 1969, a group of Sioux Indians occupied the island of Alcatraz, uh, the site of a federal prison in San Francisco uh, that had closed in 1963. They asserted that the island belonged to their tribe due to a provision that the federal government would grant them unused federal land. About 100 other Indians from various tribes, and despite um, efforts by the U.S. Coast Guard, the Indians maintained control of the island until 1971. So, took it in 69, uh, held it until 71. In 1972, uh, AIM orchestrated the Long March from San Francisco to D.C. So, in case you aren't picking up on that, that's California uh, to the other coast of the United States and D.C. Took control of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which has been around... Um, since the move to uh, do away with reservation land began. We talked about that last fall upon their arrival and temporarily renamed it the Native American Embassy, making the statement that Native, Ameri Native Americans are treated as foreigners in their own land. D. Brown published his book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, over the 1890 massacre of Sioux Indians at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. I'm sure you remember talking about this last fall. Uh, it's one of the most tragic events um, in uh, in American history, and, and one of the you know most horrific things that, that happened to Native Americans. Uh, the best-selling book raised public consciousness about the historic mistreatment and led 
to uh, or led Abe to plan a traumatic confrontation at Wounded Knee. Uh, they took over the village in late 1973, refused to leave until the government agreed to investigate the conditions of Indian reservations. Federal authorities put Wounded Knee under siege, and two Abe members were killed uh, in the resulting gunfire. The siege ended in May. The federal government agreed to investigate Indian reservations. Um, Native American actions have spurred uh, the passage of several laws in the 1970s. The Indian Self-Determination Act of 75 granted Indians greater control over their own resources and education on reservations. Prejudice against people from Japanese and Chinese ancestry come to the United States as laborers. If you don't remember, um, when we were talking about the Transcontinental Railroad, a lot of Chinese uh, immigrants were working on it, as well as Irish. Um, I'm sure you remember going over that stuff. So that's what that top old boy there is referring to. The Japanese American Citizens League was founded in 1929 to protect Japanese American civil rights. It worked for decades to receive government compensation for property lost by Japanese Americans when they were forced to abandon their homes and when they were put into internment camps during World War II after the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. I, I think you remember this. Um, went over this in World War II, uh, where Japanese Americans were forced to leave if they were on the coast, especially in California, and move inland. Um, and just kind of the, the lack of respect, uh, to put it lightly, that, that they had to go through during that wartime. In the 60s and 70s, in light of the expanding civil rights movement, many other groups form to combat discrimination to protect the rights of all Asian Americans. The consumer rights movement uh, re-emerged in the 60s and 70s, led partially by Ralph Nader. Lawyer began to investigate whether flawed car designs led to increased traffic accidents and deaths. He wrote the book, Unsafe at Any Speed. I think I've got a picture on it actually in the next section. Uh, but we've you've actually seen a video where, where he's uh, uh, been in it before. We'll watch some other things on him when, in class after this section of notes. Uh, but Unsafe at Any Speed became a bestseller and prompted Congress to pass national traffic and motor vehicle, motor vehicle safety regulations. This also led to the Nixon administration to propose the idea for occupational safety uh, and health administration, which mandated workplace safety regulations. OSHA, some of you that, that have jobs, hopefully most of you that have jobs have heard of OSHA. Um, and then the top law that I briefly mentioned, um, there weren't, you know, regulated or mandated uh, seatbelt laws and, and car seat laws and different things like that. And of course, uh, there are today, and, and one of the biggest things um, car manufacturers brag about now uh, depending on the car, they're not bragging about safety if they're trying to sell you, you know, a Corvette. But they are if they're trying to sell you, you know, an SUV or a van. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that because that has not always been the case, that it's been a, um, an important feature on cars. But it was after that law. Historically, the United States has treated people with disabilities uh, as defective, sadly. Um, there's a lot I could go into on this. Uh, I'm going to show you some things uh, regarding uh, this this part of our notes. Um, I'll just kind of briefly mention it here because um, I think it's kind of hard to, to read it and understand. I think you have to see some of it to, to really understand uh, the full impact of it. By the 1970s, disabled Americans are making uh, greater strides towards improvement, though, uh, aided tremendously by disabled veterans advocated for their own rights. Uh, the Kennedy administration did a number of things for people with mental disabilities. Uh, uh, in 1962, Eunice Shriver, who's JFK's sister, uh, started a summer camp for children with disabilities, which eventually became the Special Olympics, which is still around today. And is uh, if you've never been and, and experienced, it's, it's pretty incredible. About the 60s and 70s, the federal government would pass several laws to guarantee equal access to education for people with disabilities. So we've come a long way in that last part. I think there's still leaps and strides to go. Um, but like I said, we'll, we'll watch some stuff, um, and we'll kind of cover that a little bit better for you. 
All right, interior questions for section three. Make sure you work through those. Uh, answer, you know, what it's asking, and then we'll pick back up with section four.